Uh, good afternoon uh, and good morning here from Seoul in South Korea. Um, welcome to our Any Build and Grow webinar series. Uh, my name is Michael Ledesma and I am the chief editor here at Any Build and Grow. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how to teach writing and especially um, how to incorporate writing classes into your online teaching lessons. So if you are ready, I will go ahead and uh, start my presentation. So give me one second. Let me share my screen. Share, here we go. Okay, and now. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, nice. So let me make this smaller. Okay, everybody. So uh, the title of the presentation that we are going to cover today is Building Confident Self-Expression with Guided Writing. So, of course, I'm going to be talking to you about guided writing and explaining what guided writing is. But um, essentially, guided writing is a framework that we use to teach writing to students in an explicit way through scaffolding and through structure, and especially by exposing them to models and models of good writing. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is run through the agenda of the presentation, and then we will I will show you um, how to teach a guided writing lesson by walking you through all of the different steps. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and begin. Okay, so the agenda for today's presentation. The first thing we're going to do is talk about the development of writing skills and why this is important. Why it's important to teach writing skills as a separate subject matter or to give particular attention to writing skills in your classroom. Okay, then I'm going to explain what guided writing is and how it works as a teaching framework. And after that, I'm going to do a walkthrough of a paragraph to essay writing lesson. So what that means is paragraph to essay is a level where students are um, able to write complete paragraphs and they are getting ready to progress to paragraph, uh, multi-paragraph essays. Right. And finally, we're going to do a wrap up and I'm going to ask you some questions uh, to make sure that you understood the main concepts of the presentation. OK, so first things first, global writing proficiency. So before we get started, I want to give you um, some information about writing proficiency so that you have an idea of um, how writing is being taught. And then we can talk a little bit about how this reflects your own experiences in the classroom. So firstly, writing proficiency problems are common in many countries. For example, in the US, 20% of students in grades eight and 12, these are uh, the last uh, grade in middle school and the last grade in high school, scored below a basic level in writing. So this is uh, not very good. One out of five students is not um, writing at a basic level and only 27% performed at or above a proficient level. So of course, this is worrying and we have to start wondering why is this the case and how can we fix this problem, right? Now in the UK, um, many primary students scored below the expected level and in Germany, another country um, which we often imagine um, is very good in terms of their education system, uh, in Germany, a third of ninth graders write texts considered unacceptable on their annual writing assignments. So the question is, why is this a problem? Uh, students aren't great at writing, but what if they're good at math or good at reading comprehension? Well, why is it important for them to be good at writing? So of course, the answer to that question is, writing is an essential skill. Writing uh, in an organized way and expressing your ideas in a clear and concise manner is one of the most important tools that someone will need to have um, in all types of situations in their life. So for students to be able to write well is a very important and uh, kind of key concern that teachers should have. Now, when it comes to writing and teaching writing, um, there are lots of assumptions that we usually make. So the first assumption is, or uh, the first assumption that I've 
chosen here on this list, is that writing skills can be learned implicitly by reading lots of texts. So this is something that we assume. Now, the question is, why is this wrong? So let me go ahead and ask someone to tell me why this is wrong. So I'm going to unmute a person here and I'm gonna unmute um, Ricardo Cazares. So Ricardo, here we go. Ricardo, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay, now Ricardo, why is this assumption incorrect? Do you have any idea? having some technical difficulty here with the unmute. Okay. Hi. It can be. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. It can be because they just uh, don't need to read, they need to write. Write is a kind of different okay. ability. They need to do it. If they read just and they never write, they can learn that. Exactly, exactly. Very good. This is exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, so everybody, as Ricardo just said, reading by itself, in and of itself, is not enough to learn how to write properly. When you want to learn how to write, you need to practice writing specifically, right? So just by reading lots of text does not mean that students will automatically absorb all of the structural components in uh, good writing or all the organizational components, right? So this is something that they have to learn separately. Okay, very good. Now, uh, the next assumption is that writing skills naturally develop by writing often. So if our students are writing a lot, then their writing skills will develop naturally. Okay, so why is this incorrect? I'm going to ask Paulina Maria. So Paulina Maria, I'm going to ask you to unmute and then please tell me why this assumption is not correct. Uh, because you can uh, go into a loop of uh, mistakes. Uh, the, the idea of going into a structure is uh, the main idea of writing. Mm, okay, yeah, that's exactly correct. Thank you very much, Paulina. Okay, so everybody, as Paulina just mentioned, right, writing often without any guidance um, will not help you improve your writing. Maybe it might a little bit, but not necessarily, right? Because if you don't know what distinguishes good writing from bad writing, then you might go into this loop where you're just making the same mistakes over and over. All right, very good. So the next assumption is that good writing depends on having good ideas. Now, of course, um, it's good if you have good ideas, but a lot of times um, good ideas come out of the writing process and not at the beginning, okay? So this is one thing that we should keep in mind. How many times have you been writing something and then when you are correcting your drafts, suddenly you have uh, an idea that you hadn't thought of before and then you include that and it makes your writing better, All right? So good writing depends not only on having good ideas, but depends on going through the process so that the ideas come out of that. All right, now, good writing should look the same for everyone. Of course, this is not exactly true. If we've ever read novels by different writers, uh, we see that everyone has their own writing style and it's okay for individual characteristics to come out in different people's writing. Now, the only thing that's important to keep in mind is that uh, even though all writers are different and good writing is not necessarily the same, there are some similarities that good writers share, right? So we're going to go ahead and see what some of those could be as we are going through this uh, presentation. Okay, now let's move on and talk about some common issues in the development of writing skills. So here I'm gonna talk about uh, writing issues or common issues in two different ways. So the first one is general challenges or are general challenges in written communication for everyone. So this is for all students in their native languages, right? So what are some of these? Structure and organization, okay? How do I organize my writing, my paragraph, my essay? 
uh, opening and closing sentences. Okay, how do I write a good opening sentence to capture my audience's attention? Uh, tone, okay, depending on the audience, uh, we're going to write in different tones, formal, informal, uh, so. And then um, logical progression and flow. A lot of times uh, we see that students have trouble, and not only students, um, but lots of adults as well, have trouble with coming up with the following sentence. What comes next logically? So we have this sentence here, and then the next idea, I'm not really sure how those connect, right? So these are general challenges in written communication. Now, ESL learners, okay, learners of English, have additional challenges on top of that. So some of those are word order in sentence construction, okay? So the grammar in my native language may not be the same. Uh, and so the sentence order or word order might be different. Uh, limited vocabulary, okay? If I'm a young learner or I haven't been learning for a long time, I might not have the vocabulary tools to express myself the way that I would like. Uh, English organizational logic may be different from that of L1. So even if we're good, competent writers in our native language, maybe the rules for writing a good organized texts in English could be a little bit different. And that is the case sometimes. Um, and finally, difficulty generalizing rules from spot correction. And this is more related to grammar. So let's say that you have a student who is constantly making the same grammatical mistakes and you as a teacher are constantly correcting the same mistake. Uh, your student might not make the connection where they see, ah, I keep making this mistake. So I guess this is a structure that I should follow from now on. So that's not always clear. And it is uh, one of the challenges that um, ESL learners face. Oh, okay, sorry, before we move on, the question is, how can we help this kid? Okay, this is our student. He's very frustrated uh, in his writing. So how can we help him? Now, before we talk about guided writing and how you can help this kid, we need to talk about the writing process because the writing process is basically the main ingredient in guided writing, okay? So what guided writing does is it takes this writing process and it makes lessons out of it, out of the different phases. Okay, so before we move on, let's go ahead and run through the different stages of the writing process. So as you can see here in this picture, pre-writing is the first stage. And before you write anything, any drafts or start putting your ideas together, uh, we have to do some kind of pre-writing. And what does that involve? Well, if you look at the list here, there are some, um, there are some examples, right? Identifying the audience, defining the purpose of the writing, thinking, discussing, gathering ideas, reading and annotating, free writing and outlining, okay? So this is what you do before you start writing. There are lots and lots of steps, uh, brainstorming, discussion, right? To get the ideas flowing. And from there, we can start and move to the drafting process. So what does the drafting process involve? First, it involves sequencing your ideas, organization, uh, rethinking some ideas that you had that maybe don't fit so well, um, supporting ideas, supporting your um, opinions, uh, concise word choice, audience, and purpose. And finally, if you look at these arrows here, you'll see that the drafting process goes in a circle because after you finished your draft, you revise your draft, uh, then your teacher will give you some uh, instructions or some feedback. And then we're going to also do peer review, right? So what better way of learning how to write than um, checking and reading and editing the writing of your peers, right? So that together in a, in a classroom environment, you are um, developing your writing through the same kind of process. Now, from drafting, we go to editing. Editing, of course, grammar, punctuation, spelling, formatting, um, in-text citation and works cited. This is for a little bit higher level, so we're not gonna pay too much attention to that. But yeah, definitely grammar, punctuation, spelling, all of this stuff. And finally, the last point, and this is a point where a lot of teachers um, kind of don't really emphasize 
or don't pay too much attention to. But this is a really important point, which is publishing. Okay, so after your student has put so much effort into writing uh, a piece of writing, um, they want to be able to show what they've accomplished, right? Everyone wants to be proud of their work. So as a teacher, we have to start thinking about ways to let our students publish their work, either in the classroom, in front of their uh, classmates, or in some kind of format where um, they will receive constructive feedback and they can show what they've accomplished and what they've done, okay? So now, moving on to guided writing. What is guided writing? How does it work? Why is it good? Okay, first of all, guided writing is a way of teaching writing where learners analyze and then reproduce good models through step-by-step -step instruction. So basically, we're teaching students how to write through the analysis of models, okay? And teachers break the writing process down into smaller subtasks. So as we saw in the previous slide, we have our different phases of the writing process, but we also have small subtasks. So for example, we analyze the content of the writing. We analyze the structure. Uh, and then for ESL students, we look at vocabulary and also grammar. So there are vocabulary and grammar components to our lessons as well, so that we can give our students uh, the materials that they need to write, um, per, to produce a good piece of writing. Okay, then students receive constant feedback and input. So this is a really important part of guided writing. Students are constantly getting feedback, either from their peers or from their teacher. Yeah, so yeah, this is, this is the key from the teacher and from the peers. Okay, now, how can this help students? First of all, guided writing makes each step of the writing process clear. Okay, we know what we're doing, why we're doing it. Then, students get the tools they need to write in an organized way and according to a specific goal. So they know why they're writing this piece and they know what the steps are to accomplish the writing. Then, uh, it also, or exposing them to good writing and constantly critiquing good writing will help them identify uh, and distinguish between good and bad writing. So one thing that we should keep in mind is that when we expose students to good models, this is of course important, but we also wanna expose them to bad models so that they can get an idea of what they should not be doing. And when we do a lesson walkthrough, I'm gonna show you how you can use bad models to teach good writing. Okay, then the constant monitoring helps students improve their weaknesses. So again, if the teacher and, and the other students are constantly looking at the work, we can point out weaknesses and we can improve those weaknesses. And finally, uh, repetition and multiple drafts helps them visualize their progress. So if I'm a student and I see that my first draft was not very good and that my final draft is improved, then I will feel that the process is actually working and I will be more likely to become invested in the guided writing process and it will actually uh, motivate me to learn more. So what is the end result of this process? Over time, students develop a stable schema of what good writing looks like. Okay, so they will be able to produce good writing on their own and this is the point of guided writing, right? We want them to produce good writing independently. So if you look at this picture here, you can think of it as a metaphor, right? Guided writing is like the training wheels on the bicycle, right? We guide students through all the steps of the writing process. And at the end, once they've done this enough, they'll be able to take the training wheels off the bicycle and ride independently, okay? Right, now, so without further ado, let's go ahead and start our lesson walkthrough. So I'm gonna guide you through a guided writing lesson eat through each of the steps so that you can have an idea of what it looks like and how you can teach it. And then I'm gonna show you some tricks and tips that you can use, right? So of course, the first stage is the pre-writing stage. So what are we doing in this stage? The first thing, we're going to capture the student's attention. We want them to get involved in the lesson. So we're gonna use pictures and we're gonna talk a lot and discuss the topic so that they can feel engaged. 
right? This is going to expand their interests and orient them to the writing task. Uh, this also provides opportunities for them to hear and use the language structures that they will need in their writing. So we're gonna start practicing uh, language structures in our discussion in the class, and then they're going to use those in their writing. So this is beneficial. Um, it expands their language base and prepares them to write well. So these are the basic elements of the pre-writing task. Okay, so if you look at this picture here, you'll see what a pre-writing page or the, the basic page of a pre-writing section looks like or of a, of a guided writing unit, right? So if you look at the picture, the title of the unit is My Scariest Experience. So we're gonna be writing about our scariest experience. Now, the unit goal is writing about an experience. So students are going to learn um, the rules and some good tips for writing uh, a narrative about their experience, right? Underneath that, we have our key points. So these are grammar points that the students will need to use uh, and that they will need to master for their writing. So these are the blankest moment in my life was when uh, it happened when and while blank or after blank, something else happened, right? So these are grammar points. And then um, in the box below, we have some additional tips, right? Writing about an experience, tell, tell about something that happened in the past, describe when, where, and how something happened, and write the events in order. So these are some tips that we should keep in mind. And of course, we will be reminded about this later uh, as we go through. So let's go ahead and let's look at this picture and let's talk about it a little bit. Okay, so here you can see two pictures. And remember that the title of the unit is My Scariest Experience. So let's talk a little bit about these pictures. Okay, in the first picture, uh, there's a man and what appears to be his son on a boat. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to, in the chat box, I want you to tell me what is potentially scary about this picture. Okay, and I'm gonna check the chat box and then I'm going to uh, read some of them, okay? So everybody, what is scary? All right, very good. So Isaac Valero says that they might fall into the sea. Very good. And why would that be scary, falling into the sea? What are some of the dangers uh, involved in falling into the water? A shark. Okay, this is very good. So Rosa Myra uh, Escamilla says there are sharks, there are jellyfish. Very good. You can get stung by a jellyfish. And um, also, if they can't swim, this is very good. If they can't swim, they might have a hard time in the water. So these are some of the scary things um, about being on a boat, right? Now, in the picture underneath, we see another potentially scary situation. So what is scary about that picture? Okay, so Hector Carrion Rosales says that heights are scary, of course. And we see that the two people are on the edge of the cliff, so that's potentially very dangerous, right? They could fall, um, there could be a storm that can push them off. And if they're sleeping in sleeping bags, um, they might roll over in their sleep. So that's also uh, pretty scary, right? Okay, now some questions that you can ask when you're going through these pictures. What are the people doing in the pictures, okay? How do you think the people in the pictures feel? So that's something that we didn't uh, discuss, but how do they feel? Uh, do they look scared? Do they not look scared? Why should they be? And what is scary about each picture and why? Okay. So from there, we're going to move to um, getting our students more involved through their own experiences, right? So the question, the next question after you show this kind of picture is, what was your scariest experience? So guys, again, in the chat box, please tell me, uh, what was your scariest experience? And we'll look at some of the examples just to get an idea of some scary experiences. So let's see, scary experiences. Does anyone have any particularly interesting one? A car crash. Okay, Carla Rovi said that uh, she was in a car crash. That's pretty scary. Being fired. 
Okay, being fired could be scary in uh, a couple of different ways. Uh, learning to swim, a flying cockroach. Yeah, that's, that can be pretty scary also. Uh, an earthquake, tornadoes. Okay, drowning. Drowning is a pretty scary experience. Pirates. Okay. Yeah, oh, trying to swim for the first time. Yeah, excellent. Thank you guys very much. Yes, these are all uh, very interesting uh, examples. And of course, they are all very scary. So we would then go ahead and ask the students to elaborate and tell us, you know, what was scary about it, what happened, tell us, uh, you know, run us through a step by step process using kind of time order, right? And then this would grab their attention. Okay, so moving on. Ah, before we move on, sorry. So one thing you can do in your classroom, which is actually really helpful, is um, you can give your students grammar input and help them structure their speaking, right? So of course we want our students to talk and a lot of times our students are willing to talk, but oftentimes they don't um, give us perfect grammar right off the bat. So one tip that I like to give is that you as a teacher can structure um, the speaking activity by giving them input uh, in terms of a grammar structure. So here, down here, what I've written is, my scariest experience was when I, past tense verb, right? So uh, for the people who said, uh, learned how to swim, okay, my scariest experience was when I first learned how to swim, okay? My scariest experience was when I was in a car crash, okay? So if we are giving our students structure like this, then we're already helping them get into the correct um, frame of mind for their writing and we're giving them additional tools that they can use later to structure and um, make sure that their writing is, is good and correct, right? Okay, so moving on. Now, a warm-up exercise. We're still talking about scary experiences, right? So in this activity, you see that there are events and feelings so, but before we do that, before we look at those, what I want to do is I want to black those out because I just want my students to give me input based on what they already, already know. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the pictures and the boxes, and I want you guys in the chat box to tell me what happened and how they feel. So let's only focus on this first one, just as an example. I want you to tell me what happened to this boy and how does he feel? Okay, so let me check in the chat box and see what you guys think. Right, let's see. Aha, uh -huh. he lost his dog. Okay, this is very good. The boy lost his dog and he felt terrible. Yes, excellent. He feels sad because he lost his dog. Very good. Okay, so this is an excellent example, right? And this, of course, is before you have told me uh, anything or before we've seen any of the vocabulary. This is just, you know, kind of um, improvising, right? So after we've allowed our students to do this and to talk about the pictures, then we can go ahead and reveal uh, some of these vocabulary words. So on the first, uh, in the first box, we see events. So have a car accident, lose his pet, win first place, go to the amusement park. And here, what you're gonna do is you're going to uh, remind your students to use the past tense because these are things that happened in the past, right? So we're gonna conjugate all of these verbs, had a car accident, lost his pet, won first place, went to the amusement park. And then we're gonna go through the feelings. And of course, uh, you're going to explain the different vocabulary words to students, but also if they already know some other words that they want to use to describe these pictures, that's also good. They can also do that. And if you want to introduce other words that are not included, you can also do that as a teacher. Okay, so let's go to the next section now. So we've done some pre-writing exercises and the students are basically ready to go. They've discussed and we've talked a lot about different scary experiences. So now we're going to start the drafting process. So what does the drafting process involve? Right? Well, first of all, you should remember that composing is a skill that has to be learned, just like spelling or the correct use of punctuation. Right? So what does that mean? 
It means that scaffolding and modeling must be made explicit. Okay, when you're teaching writing, the organizational structure and modeling have to be explicit, right? Implementation does not only involve look and do, so look at this model and then write like it, that, but also you have to constantly ask them, right? What do you see? Why is this important? So that they can internalize the rules for uh, good writing, All right? So you want to elicit examples. And now, uh, like we mentioned earlier, showing incorrect examples is good because it reinforces good applications and clarifies bad applications. So I'm gonna show you how that works in a second. Uh, but first of all, we're gonna start with a good model. So again, 30 seconds, my scariest experience, please read the model so that we can talk about it afterwards. Okay, go. So what we're doing now is I'm going to give you 30 seconds to read this model so that afterwards we can discuss it a little bit. Okay, so you have 30 seconds, please just read through the model um, and try to remember as much as you can. Okay. Okay, everybody. So I think that was 30 seconds. Let's go ahead and do some reading comprehension. Okay, so we're going to do a content analysis. Now, let's run through these questions. And uh, let's, again, type it in the chat box. Okay, so the first question is, what is the paragraph about? Okay, so this is someone's scariest experience. But what was that scary experience? So go ahead and tell me. So someone said a scary experience. It's very good. Ha, huh, getting lost. Getting lost where? In the woods. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So the paragraph is about a boy who was lost in the woods. Very good. Okay. Now, the question is when and where did this event take place? So we've already got the woods, um, but when did it take place? How old was the boy? Oh, two years ago. Very good. Two years ago when he was 10. Okay. Excellent. Or actually, ha. It's not a boy after all, uh, it's a girl. So let's go to the third question. When did the writer realize she was lost? So when did she realize that she was lost? About an hour later, okay, after 30 minutes. Ah, we've got some different uh, answers here. Somebody said 30 minutes later, all right? So let's go back and check very quickly to make sure that we've got it, huh? After walking for about 30 minutes, I realized I was lost, okay, right? And finally, number four, how did the writer's parents feel when the writer got back, okay? They were angry, uh, then happy, okay, very good. They were angry, but they were glad that she was safe. Okay, excellent, thank you guys very much. That was perfect, that was exactly what we're looking for. Okay, now from the content analysis, we're going to move into uh, a writing outline. Okay, so this is how you transition from content analysis to structural analysis. Okay, so as you can see, we've got all the sections of the model written out, but they're organized according to the structure. So here's where you're going to start making the structural elements more explicit, right? So at the very top, as you can see here, We've got the scariest moment, the topic sentence. And so we're going to fill in that blank. And the scariest moment was when I got lost in the woods. Then from there, we're going to move into the body. And the body is going to include some important information. Uh, and it's going to answer our five W questions. OK, so when did it happen? Where did it happen? And then tell me what happened in the order of events. OK. Uh, and finally, we have our closing. And in the closing, we're going to fill in that blank. So you should never do what you did again. All right? OK. So now, our students have read the model. Uh, they've answered the questions. And now, they've organized the information 
according to this outline, right? So, so far, so good. Now, we're going to give them a little bit more by showing them a bad model, and we're going to ask them to improve it, okay? So this is something that you can add. Of course, it's not in the lesson, but uh, by adding it to the lesson and giving students a little bit more input, you're helping them distinguish between good and bad writing. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to read this very quickly, and then I want you to tell me which parts are not that good compared to the model that we read before, right? And how we can fix some of those parts, okay? So again, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and I want you to look for mistakes or something that's not good and uh, think about how we can fix it, okay? So 30 seconds. All right, so in the chat box, I'm seeing some suggestions here. The first one, we should make use of some connectors. Okay, this is very good. Yes, uh, there are some parts that seem redundant. Okay, nice. And here she is not using connectors such as while, when, as, right? Ah, and it doesn't say when this happened. Okay, this is very good. So content-wise, we're missing information, right? Sequence words. Okay, so let's go ahead and run through it together. Right now, the first thing is your opening sentence. Right, so your opening sentence is not really scared one time. This doesn't really grab my attention, and it doesn't tell me a lot. Right, so how can we fix that? The scariest moment in my life was when I heard a scary noise in my room. Okay, so this is going back to the the key sentence and the structure. Right, this is. Um, a lot better, it grabs your attention a lot more forcefully, and it has um, the grammar structure that we were learning earlier, right? Okay, now let's move on. This sentence, it was because I heard a strange noise, right? So how can we fix that? Okay, we need to first of all talk about when this happened, and then we can elaborate, right? So from the beginning, the scariest moment in my life was when I heard a scary noise in my room. It happened five years ago when I was six. Okay, so this is going back to the model. We're following the model. The model is good and this is bad. Right? I was laying in bed, getting ready to sleep. Then I heard a strange noise. So as you see, um, a lot of you mentioned that connectors are important here. And yes, you're right. We need some connectors to kind of establish the flow of the writing. So I heard a strange noise. It was outside my bedroom window. It sounded like a scratching sound. I was too afraid to check what it was. Then my dad came into my room. He heard the sound from his bedroom too. He opened the window and saw what was making the noise. It was a cat. So here, then my dad came into my room. Let's get rid of that. And let's make it a little bit more interesting so we're not repeating the same connectors, right? Then, then, then. So after a few minutes, my dad came into my room. You see, that's a lot more uh, exciting or it's a lot more, um, it, it gives a better image, right? It's a lot clearer in explaining what's going on, right? It gives you a, a better picture. Okay, then it was a cat. That day, I learned not to be afraid of strange sounds anymore. All right, so, uh, as you just saw here, we took a piece of writing that was not great, had a lot of problems. Uh, and of course, as a teacher, you, you should be able to make this, right? So this is something that I wrote pretty quickly, just looking at the model, made my own example, um, with some mistakes that were included on purpose. And then you let your students teach you how this could be improved, right? And this is one way that students learn really well, is by um, filling the shoes quote unquote, of the teacher and explaining to you why things are uh, good or bad. 
Okay, now, from there, we're going to move to sentence building, which is, of course, very important for L2 learners, right, ESL learners. They need to learn how to um, write their sentences so that they can then use them in the writing. So here we've got a sentence building exercise, right, and this is about, uh, or this is related to the opening sentence, right? So the opening sentence is going to be structured, the blankest superlative moment in my life was when something happened. Right. So as you can see, we've got our adjectives here, and these are all in the superlative case. And then uh, we've got situations. Okay, and what the students are going to do, of course, is they are going to choose the correct adjective and make the sentence. So everybody, the first example that we have here is get lost in the woods, and then I have to find the correct adjective. So the scariest moment in my life was when I got lost in the woods. So again, remind the students to use the past tense for the verb in the, uh, in the dependent clause, right? So now let's do number one together. Okay, everybody in the chat box, win the lottery. Choose the adjective and make a sentence with win the lottery. And let's see what you can come up with. Okay, guys. So what do you have for number one, win the lottery? The blankest moment in my life. Is everyone here? Aha, perfect. The happiest time, okay, time is okay, right? Day is fine, but we're using moment, remember, moment. But day, time, it works. So we'll go with that. The happiest time in my life was when I won the lottery. The most exciting moment in my life was when I won the lottery. Okay, these are all really good examples. So thank you very much. Now we're going to move on. So a lot of times uh, when we're teaching, we see this page and we just go through it and the students answer the questions and they can do it. So it's great, right? Perfect. They got it. Moving on. But we don't just want to do that, right? We want to give them chances to practice a little bit more. So one thing that I like to do, and especially these days, now that a lot of us are teaching online, is to use some uh, online tools and online games to practice with these kinds of exercises. So um, in the classroom, typically, uh, you could or you would transform this sentence builder exercise into this uh, matching game. All right, so how does it work? The sentence builder matching. All right, so on one side, you've got superlatives. On the other side, you've got the situations. And then what happens is students flip a card from each side, and then they make a sentence according to the given structure. Now, you can write the structure on the board, or uh, you can just have them use it from memory. But the point is that they're going to be flipping the cards, and they're going to be making sentences. Now, of course, not all of those sentences are going to make sense, right? A lot of examples will be silly because they're randomly flipping the cards. So um, you might get something like the scariest moment in my life was when I won the lottery. And of course, that's silly. So then you'd want to have the students uh, make corrections and change the superlative or change the situation uh, according to whichever one they want right but this gives them additional practice and it's fun because you get silly examples and um, it'll help them remember this a lot better right so after we've done all of these activities we're going to go into the brainstorming so of course this is a drafting stage so now we want our students to brainstorm their own idea for their own essay right so we've got our brainstorming um, mind map and what they're going to do is they're going to write down their own ideas here. Then on the following page, they're going to organize those ideas according to the structure that we taught them, right? Topic, sentence, body uh, with five W's and then closing. And underneath, we've got some uh, feelings and experiences and some vocabulary that they can use um, to make their essay um, more interesting or to increase the level of vocabulary, right? And then finally, we've gotten to our draft page where we're going to write it, okay? So, and all of the things that we've done so far have led up to this 
first draft, okay? So this is just the first draft, but by the time you get to this draft, as you've seen, you've prepared your students to do basically all of the writing um, without having to think too much about it because they've done all the thinking already. So now they can just go ahead and draft and their draft will be relatively complete and relatively good. So after we've done all the pre-writing stuff, the first draft should only require some minor adjustments, right? Because they know what they're doing. So after analyzing the model text and brainstorming ideas and drilling grammar, students are ready to write. Now, they've done their first draft. Okay, this is finished. Now we're gonna edit. All right, so in the editing stage, students get the opportunity to write both with and without scaffolding. So this is how we're going to slowly uh, transition toward independence, right? Students practice internalizing the rules and structures of composition and teachers during this part of the lesson should lean in whenever necessary and provide strong feed forward. So what does that mean feed forward? It means that when your students, when you see that your students are having a hard time coming up with ideas, you just lean in and you look at what they're writing, you make some suggestions, ask some questions. What about this? Oh, have you thought about that? Or mm, what do you think about this? All right, to kind of help your students along in the thinking process. All right, so teachers should ask leading questions to help guide students in the right direction. Okay, and this is all part of the editing process. And finally, writers should focus their attention on the areas that need to be improved. Okay, so to focus on improvement, we need to have some kind of rubric or guideline. So one cool thing is that you can either, if the book that you're using is a good one, it'll have this already, um, but you can also create this yourself, right? So how does this work? This is something that you give the students when they exchange their writing with their classmates, right? In this case, this is a very clear example and all they have to do is just follow the instruction. So revising points. Did you introduce what kind of experience you had in the topic sentence? If I'm a student and I'm looking at my classmates writing, this is very clear. Did they do that? Did they introduce the, the experience, yes or no? So check or not check. Did you explain when, where, and how the experience happened? Okay, easy, I just look for it and I find it, right? Did you write the events in order? And did you write a good closing sentence? So these are the key points that we are going to look for in this writing exercise specifically, all right? Now each writing exercise will be different, so you're going to have different key points that you want your students to focus on for different types of writing. Okay, then we have editing points. So grammar, is grammar good? Capitalization, punctuation, spelling, right? And then underneath that, you've got teachers' comments. So then teachers are going to add additional comments and they're gonna give uh, some tips that the students should remember for next time, okay? Remind them to do something that maybe they forgot. All right, now, um, yeah, so we're gonna pair our students up of course, as part of the editing process and have them analyze each other's work. And then we're gonna to move to the final draft. So after we've done all of this, students should be ready to give you a final draft with all of these considerations included and their writing should be basically as close to the model in terms of organization and quality as possible. Right? This is what we want. We want our students to get approach the model but with their own content and this shows that they've internalized the rules and that they're on the right track all right so students get one more chance to put together everything they've learned and teachers get one last chance to give constructive feedback all right now after we've done that publishing okay again cannot emphasize this enough publishing is very important so young writers need an audience okay why are we writing what is the purpose of writing if nobody's going to read my writing besides my classmates who are criticizing me, right? I want praise. I want people to look at my writing and tell me how good it is, right? So sharing promotes the development of students' ability to convey information. Now, how does this work? Okay, so let's say that you've got a student who's maybe not so good, but then they see their classmates or a classmate who's a little bit better and they're presenting their writing in front of an audience. That student can then maybe pick up some tips uh, if they see it in that context, right? So th that's another way for them to learn, 
right? Students get a general sense of what they need to improve on by being exposed to the writing of others. And teachers can make suggestions and reinforce those suggestions later with more formal assessments, right? So um, when your student presents, you can give them feedback even on their presentation, right? Okay, so on your speaking or your cadence of, of how you read the sentences, right? All of this is something that teachers can help their students improve, right? Okay, so now we've reached the end of the presentation. So I've got a wrap up quiz for you guys. I'm gonna ask you some very basic questions about the presentation to see how much of this you remember and to see if any of this uh, was helpful to you, right? So first question, what are the four steps of the writing process? So let me check the chat box and you tell me what the four steps are. Okay, everybody. So go ahead, write it in the chat box. What are the four steps that we talked about at the very beginning? All right, waiting, waiting, waiting. Pre-writing, that's the first one, yes. Drafting, editing, and what's the last one? Publishing, yes, very good. All right, thank you very much. Let's go on to the next question. What are some activities you can do during pre-writing? Okay, everybody. So pre-writing, what were some of the activities that we did? Let's see if you remember. So the first thing we did in pre-writing was to look at something. We looked at pictures, right? And then we discussed what was scary about the pictures to get them started and engaged with the topic, right? Brainstorming. We did some listing. Right. So we looked at more pictures and we talked about what was happening in those pictures. Right. The boy with the lost dog who was scared. All right. Very good. We're gathering ideas for our for eventually uh, being exposed and analyzing our model. Right. So very good. Yep. Now, why do students need a good model text? What is the purpose of the model text within the context of guided writing? OK. Why? So to have a guide, to follow it. Okay, very good. Uh, anybody, anybody else? Ah, to get the skill, because they need a model to follow. Okay, very, very good. So by giving our students a model of good writing, we're exposing them to what good writing looks like. And then by analyzing it, they're understanding what it is that makes this particular piece of writing good and so that they can have an idea of how to replicate that later on. Okay, now, how should the teacher help during the editing process? So what are some things teachers should do when they are in the editing stage of the guided writing lesson? All right, let's see, let's see. What does the teacher do? Lean on, lean in. Yes, very good. So lean in, make suggestions, ask leading questions. Okay, guiding them through the proper steps, giving them tips, examples. Yes, very good. Okay, and what are some ways that students can get feedback? So how can students get feedback? I've written my model text and now I need some feedback. So peers, very good. Peers using rubrics that they can check, right? check marks uh, or a list of different uh, qualities or characteristics that they should look for in their uh, classmates text. All right, very good. You've got any other ones? Okay, so that is all. Thank you guys very much for participating in this seminar. And um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to write them in the chat box and then we will go over them. Um, and then wrap this up. So once again, thank you very much. And yeah, go ahead. I'll give you a little bit of time to uh, ask any questions that you may have about this presentation.